The Reaction Podcast is back. Actually, we've decided just to go back to the format that we used to really like doing. It's almost as though there's been some kind of pandemic and things have been shaken up and we're going back to some kind of uh, normality. All sorts of other things are available uh, as YouTube videos. This will be a YouTube video as well, but it really is just the old Reaction podca Podcast format that we haven't really been running for a while. I'm joined by... Maggie Pagano, my colleague from Reaction, and Alistair Ben from Reaction. I'm Ian Martin, editor of Reaction. There's tons to talk about, and I think we should probably kick off, shouldn't we, Maggie, with Russia and Ukraine, where well, it's been a it's been a big uh, week on that front with diplomatic efforts by the Brits with. Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary there, and Liz Truss. And you wrote for the site, uh, or we wrote on the site, about the backlash to her, her joint appearance with Lavrov, the, the mm -hmm. Russian Foreign Minister, and, and what was wrong, or what was deemed to have gone wrong. Well, what um, it was, um, they'd obviously had their talks, and then they had a press um, conference afterwards, and Lavrov was rather uh, rude to trust and said that it was like talking to a deaf person. Um, and um, Truss was actually quite uh, strong in hitting back against him. But what was very surprising and rather upsetting was the response given by a lot of the British media um, to her. They almost seemed to be preferring Lavrov's response than, than hers. And I think a lot of us felt that this was really rather mean um, about her. These were genuine efforts on the British part. Boris Johnson's already been to Kiev. Ben Wallace is in um, Moscow today, I believe. And it seemed rather, there's that sort of sense that why would you uh, be wanting to support the Russian uh, response in this rather than our own um, British Foreign Secretary, who is genuinely trying to calm yeah. things down? Yeah, I... Th I, th I it was I, astonishing, I, I, actually. Yeah, I was rather taken aback by it maybe it's a legacy of all the Brexit wars and the infighting, the national infighting, just this assumption on the part of some people who shall remain nameless. Certainly not all. And there were, it's not a, it's, this is not a Brexit remain division necessarily, but there just does seem to be a strand of, I was going to call it elite opinion, but it's not that because on, on Twitter, it's, it's, it's pretty widespread among a certain kind of um uh you know certain kind of what's the what's the phrase community or set of interest groups and the view is just well it's britain it's the british foreign secretary so obviously we are inherently crap at everything so when uh, lavrov who i mean this is this is lavrov you know this is this is this is the guy who last week said russia is never attacked russia only responds you know, defensively which is the old stalinist line which was used to explain what the russians what the soviets did in concert with the germans in 1939 in concert with the nazis in 1939 when they subdivided or they, they divided in half poland and killed the intellectuals and um, massacred the office officer class uh, on, on the russian side and plundered the country now, so that that's that's Lavrov, who's prepared to use those old twentieth-century Stalinist um, ways of speaking about history. That, that's who you're dealing with. It's someone ultra cynical, highly intelligent, a real manipulator on the uh, on the foreign stage, and Truss was, I, I thought, was pretty. He tries to play a few tricks, but I thought she was pretty robust in delivering a message that has been the UK policy, which I think the Brits have actually handled it uh, really pretty well. And so she expressed that fairly clearly. Do you agree, Alistair, or, or disagree? Uh, I thought at the press conference, she was, as you said, she uh, delivered the line that, um, you know, has been the line, for, including Ben Wallace, including Boris Johnson, talking about the self-determination of Ukraine and saying that it's a, a core principle of the kind of Western alliance that shouldn't be violated. And she did that. Uh, you know, I, as a, 
you know, in my own small way, as a kind of me in the medium term, having been critical of Liz Truss, I don't think she's a very good foreign secretary. And she's done several things over the last six months, which are um, kind of uh, alarming to me. There was a moment when she, uh, in the aftermath of the AUKUS pact, um, was photographed like making a joke about how, you know, uh, French champagne isn't great and we prefer Australian sparkling wine or something like that. I, I may have got that wrong. It was along those lines. And I just thought, you know, you're supposed to be foreign secretary of the United Kingdom. Right? Don't make cheap jokes about a um, a strategic alliance which has really pissed off one of our closest partners and has really embarrassed them. And I just thought, you know, and I, the, the visit to Moscow, I you know, I don't see Ben Wallace posing for the cameras quite so much as Truss. You know, in the in the Russian style hats and walking around Red Square. I don't know. But there, there has to be an element of, you know, kind of politicking there that, you know, I mean, all politicians are vain and politic, but I don't know. I, I felt she didn't exactly do herself any favours. But do you not do you not feel, though, that women in, in those situations are then held to a, a different standard and there's a there's a there's a focus on the outfit? I mean, as you noted, Maggie, earlier in the week, it's. It's it's cold. It's cold in Moscow, particularly at this time of year. <laughs> and that's what that that's what you wear. I mean, yeah. that's that yeah. that's what a hat for a woman looks like. What she's supposed to wear instead is she's supposed to say, "I better not be seen wearing something that looks a bit like the hat that Thatcher wore, or lots of people wear in Russia when they're in Russia." Uh, I'll wear a baseball cap instead, um, or, or something, which means I won't be criticised by certain people in, you know, in, in British in British. Media. Having been to Russia and worn a T-shirt and trainers, I, I disagree. You don't need well, to dress I, it up like. But it wasn't in February. But it wasn't, in February. wasn't in February. I've been to Moscow in the yeah. winter. Walked around the Kremlin at midnight in the snow in about minus ten degrees. It is cold, I can tell you. And you wouldn't, you know, would you want her to wear a sort of anorak, duvet <laughs> down type thing? You know, I mean, honestly, why not? A, so far why not along. a patriotic? Why not a patriotic? British hat, you know, one of the, you know, well, great... Like a game teaser. Of our, a, a hod, a hod or a, a kind of... Oh, come on. Muffled game... Yeah, a gamekeeper's get-up or something that oh. gestures to our kind of rural inheritance and, you know... Deep England, you know. I think it was a. I think it was. A, I think it was a nice standard hat. I don't think she meant anything by it. I don't think she was trying to mimic Thatcher or... Um, I, 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 I don't. I know Nonsense. she's been criticised in the past for for doing that. Do you think, though, Maggie, that on? Do you think Britain is? Am I being too sanguine about this, or too, uh, you know, patriotic about it? And I just think I think the British position is broadly correct, which is different from the French position. The French position is: look, there's always something that can be negotiated here. The British position, without without attempting to be too confrontational is to say that there really isn't there isn't a grubby compromise to be done that this is fairly fundamental question of self-determination for ukraine the baltic states and poland who can who can as, as ben wallace said the other evening uh, uh, in, in, in his interview that they they should be able to make the alliances that they that they choose Yes, yes, I do broadly agree with that principle, but you can also see maybe we should look at how the Russians feel about it, which is that they see that the eastern part of the NATO has expanded and is sitting all the way around its borders. And what they want to do is go back to the Minsk agreement, which I believe France is a signatory to, and they want some assurance that there won't be further expansion. So maybe there is some sort of room in between to compromise, certainly not what Macron was after, the, the sort of Finland, Finlandization of Ukraine. I mean, that basically means takeover, doesn't it? That was, yeah. um, I think... Um, yeah, and it gives, it gives, it gives Russia... It, it would give Russia all sorts of vetoes on... Ukraine's um, freedom for manoeuvre mm. and also what if you look at the ridiculous document the demands issued by the Russians 
uh, which is the cause of all of the, essentially the cause of all of this this thing they put on the table saying there is no negotiation this is Rus russia's position and then if anything short of full agreement is uh, is, is 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 confrontational and that really is a, what they're wanting to do is to dictate who countries like Poland and Sweden can and Finland can cooperate with in terms of military defense security and intelligence they are attempting to make those those places spheres of russian influence mm -hmm. and divide the west i mean they're helped in all of this of course aren't they by the west being alistair pretty divided because the german and french position as we discussed earlier but the french position but also in alliance with germany is to try and find some compromise in some way through and then on the other side of germany the poles with a lot of experience of the consequences of being trapped between the germans and the and, and the russians historically the poles the poles look to countries like britain and look to nato's leadership really fearing um, the, the prospects of some sort of compromise. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, on the German position, I mean, it's, you know, there's a constituency in in the in the kind of German debate, which says, you know, I think you can understand why Germans find it very difficult, the idea of sending arms to fight Russians, because yeah, not in the total nightmare of the 20th century and the story of you know, Germans in Russia. I mean, I'm reading Vasily Grossman's Life and Fate at the moment, which is about Stalingrad and oh. about the kind of broad sweep of the Soviet experience in the in the Second World War. What I find interesting, again, I'm no expert on Russian history at all. Don't you know? Just you know, really not at all. But the it's there. There must be a kind of um, sort of set of emotions around Ukraine and Russia that I think probably make the British viewpoint sound tinnied because, it, you know, you look on in Grossman's Life and Fate, Ukrainians and Russians are indistinguishable people. They fight for the same side. They have the same likes and, and dislikes. They talk that there's so much travel between Ukraine and the rest of Russia. You know, in the, the officers in Stalingrad, some are Ukrainian, some are Russian. It seems to be like the the least amount of division um, between kind of characters. Whereas it's it's noted that, for example, like Tatar characters very much do have a different view of their minority within the Soviet system in, in the book. And it's just it just got me thinking. You know, when um, Ben Wallace writes, a, however eloquent, a piece about Putin's kind of essay on Ukrainian identity or or um, Liz Truss in a meeting with Lavrov gets wrong territories which were part which are just part of Russia and says you know I think it's Voronezh she in the meeting claims was, was disputed and Rostov I mean it's just that you know offense flies two ways I think and I think there can be a little bit of a misreading of the Russian position and and we and the Brits have, for a century, been misreading the Russian mindset. Um, we published a great essay on Engelsberg Ideas, the site um, we run, and about by Michael Goodman at, at King's College London, entitled Re Misreading the Russian Mindset, which is about the Joint Intelligence Committee over the last 70 years, getting the Russian position slightly wrong. And it happens quite a lot. Yeah. And I don't know. I think there's an element of... I think we just have to have an element of humility at the moment about you, you mentioned know, I get, I get you, you, our allies like Poland are saying that Britain are, are, are lending support and Zelensky is pleased that we're doing it. And I think that's really important. And I support that. But I just think the picture seems it's sort of unclear at the moment what precisely is the game. Um, you see, I disagree. So I disagree. But first, firstly, just a, a plug for you mentioned Engelsberg Ideas, which is a fantastic site, which is produced by Alistair and members of the reaction team. And it's th this week, the next phase of its development. And it is it, 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 it features a lot of the 
best sort of writers and thinkers and academics and historians and philosophers from around the world. And the next phase of its development is has a new book section, which uh, which launches uh, launched today and is available. We'll put a we'll put a link below and um, and send out a link to to reaction subscribers to make sure that you you see it. And there's a fabulous review of um, Zubak's uh, Zubok's new book on the collapse of the Soviet Union, which is fabulous fabulous book essentially a revisionist account blaming Gorbachev and via really good deep dive in the archives and new material rethinking how you should think about the end of the the, the Soviet Union and the arrogance of the West in that period now I, I I get all of that and I have to say if you asked me the question maybe 10 years ago I would have been of the mindset which is which said look we've always we've mis, long misread the Russians we have to think about Russia differently we have to understand that somewhere like Ukraine okay it's independent but it's within for the reasons you described within a broad Russian sphere of influence and Russia wants pride and respect from the West and I have to say my view shifted a lot actually in the last couple of years partly just from reading more widely on it and talking to Russia heads and people who who, 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 you know, academics who spend a lot of time in this in this zone, and actually, I think uh, Sikorsky, the former um, former Polish defense minister, who's been incredibly robust on this, I think his analysis, which is done almost to the point of caricature, I think he's absolutely right, and I think those, and he he essentially says, look, do not, you know, you have to be as robust as possible particularly with this Russian um, regime but you have to think you have to the only thing it respects is being really really hard-nosed about potential conflict and not falling for the myth of Russia which and you know various academics have written about this but it, it is an inherently this is not directed at individual Russians but it is a ludicrous notion this myth of Mother Russia, this idea of Russia having a soul and being unique among all uh, all countries in terms of its kind of God given status, and this this is endless sentimentality and romanticism about Russia, which and it's of course it had the traumas of the twentieth century, but large parts of the, that trauma was were self inflicted, um, uh, you know, self inflicted by Russian regimes on Russians. And so I, I think I think Sikorsky's right. I think, and that's not the British government position, and his is a, he's a robust, robust Polish, uh, it takes a sort of robust Polish view of the situation. But I think that, that to me is much more persuasive than as just falling for this myth of, uh, myth of Russia. I mean, Maggie, you probably disagree with me. Um, slightly. I think all countries have mythologies about themselves, don't they? Um, a, a, Russian, um, a Russian politician I um, once um, spoke to said, what do you have to understand? If you want to understand Russia, Maggie, stand in Moscow and look south. Look at the borders. We feel that we are being encircled by the rest. And I think there is a sense of that they don't have their own sea outlets, um, which is why Syria and so forth, these countries are so important to them. Um, and Ukraine was, has been uh, part of uh, Russia for years. I mean, I believe if I've got, I've been to Kiev and I've seen uh, Bulgarov's house. There are a lot of, I believe Tchaikovsky may have been Ukrainian. You know, their, their cultures are so entwined. Well, it depends on the right, on the on west and east. I mean, there's a there's a yeah, no, sure. there's a there's a division. Yeah. So, but but to, to get to the, the the nuts of this um, nuts and bolts is Russia is terrified that Ukraine will join NATO. I mean, that is sort of really what got this started, isn't it? Um, and you know what I guess the diplomats have to decide is Jens Stoltenberg has said. You know, it's up to each country individually. We obviously won't force. Um, the Ukraine has said it will not join. It will not join, but it did want to join the EU. I think that maybe um, 
you can understand why Russia would not want Ukraine part of NATO. Why um, though? Why that? So let's let just because on, on then you've got you, then you've got on the borders like my man saying look at look at the country from standing from Moscow. Then you've got if you like the the Western influence sitting on every border, and I think the Russians feel very insecure. Well, it's, it's they insecure. do. Well, they clearly they they clearly, they clearly do. But I I'm just asking the fundamental question: What would be wrong with that? I can understand why that that would doesn't fit with Vladimir Putin's conception of what Russia is. And someone put it to me the other day, he actually really, really, if you, you, you read that essay, he also wants Cap Constantinople. Now that's, yeah. he's, he's not going to, he's, you know, he's not going to, and Rome going to as invade, well. but and the Turkey and the Turkish, well, the Turkish economy is in, in a really difficult, um, difficult place, but he's at, at the moment. And then that standoff between that, weird relationship between Turkey and and Russia. They've been enemies for a long time, but then they have understandings and Turkey is reliant on Russian Russian gas to an extraordinary extent. Turkey's got inflation of um you know thirty six percent, eighty percent unofficially. And but Turkey's also a NATO member, a key NATO member and supports Ukraine. So you've got all of that tension. I can understand that tension, but I don't. I don't think that. that I don't think that. I, I don't actually think Ukraine would or will join NATO. But even if it did, what's the? What's I mean? What, what's the pro, what, What's the problem? What are they fearing? What do they? What do they have to fear from the Swedes, the Finns, the Poles, Ukrainians, who are all countries where the populations are overwhelmingly want peace and don't want to have a, a war or fight with anyone and want to get on with the business of prosperity and making their way in the world. It's not as though any of them are planning or secretly have some deep historical desire to, 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 um, to invade, um, you know, to invade exactly. Russia. Obviously, the, obviously the Germans have tried that and the French have tried it, but I mean, the, the Poles, you know, the Poles, the Ukrainians and the, and the Swedes and the Finns just, don't want to be menaced by by Moscow. No, and I think that's the question that I would have for President Putin, whether it's Boris or Biden, whatever, say, why are you so scared? Do you actually think that NATO is going to invade you? What is it that has led you to this position? Sort of turn it round in a sense. He is saying that Western um, having more troops in Romania and Poland is aggressive towards the Russians, but, but does he actually believe it? It's it's he's never mm -hmm. expressed that, and I don't quite know what his answer would be. Yeah. But he can't believe that. Anyway, to explain that, Maggie, I think you have to sort of try and future plan what Fortress Russia, how Fortress Russia, which is how it's developed, sees mm -hmm. itself as a kind of tragic onlooker on world affairs, which is mm -hmm. as Ian, as, as you were saying, the kind of um you know, sort of bullshit view um, rooted in a lot of fake history, a lot of bad history. Um, and that's the one that's become quite salient. But from their perspective, they look at the world and they see maybe in the next 20 or 30 years, you know, the way migration will um, work from the global south, you know, an inevitable and tragic consequence of um you know changes in our climate you know wars instability it, russia will look at the seaways through to the gulf and see places hedged with geopolitical threat it looks to china i know russia and china are now supposed to be best buddies but fundamentally russia will not cede control of the kind of eurasian landmass mm. to to a chinese kind of to the to the Chinese states. That's not just not going to happen in in places like the Stans, places which, you know, are seen as part of Russia's sphere of influence. So it, it goes so far. So from their perspective, however paranoid and wrong-headed they are, they look on the world as an in, as a dangerous place which doesn't have Russia's interests at heart at all. And they're saying, well, we need to, we want what NATO has of in effect, a place to position, you know, in times of threat to position missiles and put troops and 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 to do all that as well i think i don't know is that that's probably too charitable but 
I, That's interesting. And I think it's dreadful. It's, you know, they cannot do what they're going to, what potentially they might do in Ukraine without serious um, pushback from the West. And it has yeah. to be more than material. It has to be real political and material aid to Ukraine and and, and sort of physical stuff. And that just has yeah. to happen. But but I'm, I, just, I just think the mindset is one. I, I'm just not sure what we're doing by pointing out that the Russians are, um, you know, are, the Russians are sort of nasty and they just want to take back bits of Eastern Europe because they, when, when they look at the world, they see a, a yeah, well, world with no guarantees and they're trying to find some guarantees and to make their presence felt. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, no, no, I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not, not certainly not saying that Russians are nasty, uh, but plenty of, um, plenty of nice and charming and interesting and intelligent I mean, policy, Russians. That's, policy, that's not, not the point. Yeah, not the point I'm making. But just I, I, I just think it's more fundamental than that. I just think li- leave these countries alone. It's like Pol- Poland wants to be Poland. Don't menace it. Don't um, don't tell. You know, don't present a sort of fake historical picture about what happened. We all mm-hmm. know what happened in the 19, late 1930s and early 1940s, and then through the Cold War. So just. Let it exist and try and find a, a route to coexistence, but that requires some kind of historical honesty and um, you know it requ- just requires plain dealing. Which and that's that's what troubles me about this situation. And it's not just Poland that's getting it; it's the it's it's the the, uh, the Baltic states, which of course they still see as somehow having been stolen from them in the in the in the settlement and in the in the dissolution of the of, of the soviet empire it's their their strange attitudes to to finland and to to contemporary um sweden and then you know their attitude to to ukraine i think we should let we, we talked a lot there about russia and U, and ukraine you're listening to the Reaction podcast, which is back. We've decided actually just to go back to the old format where we talk about the things that have interested us in the in the news or culture or whatever grabs us on any given week. So should we talk, we always used to on these podcasts talk a lot about UK politics when there was a lot of it about during the referendum or not during the aftermath of the, of the referendum and the craziness of politics then, but Politics is still pretty crazy now. Let's talk about Boris and survival. Maggie, I'll kick off with uh, with you. Can he survive a fixed penalty notice, a fine, and or are are these claims by Team Boris briefed anonymously that it doesn't really matter? It's only like a parking ticket. Is that sustainable? Um, I think if he's survived this far, he'll probably survive. A fixed uh, penalty, yeah, um, because in in a sense, the, the crime has already been committed, and I think that's been accepted. What is astonishing now is that the party have not taken action against him, and I think the longer they leave it, the more likely he is to survive the whole thing. Actually, the moment has probably even gone. It was two weeks ago, so now I think people are slightly bored by it. And they might, if it's £10,000 that he has to pay, um, they'll just, I think most people, certainly if you're talking about general public, would just say, well, that's absolutely right. They, they got it wrong. They're going to be fined. It's the political reaction from his own MPs that's the important one and will decide whether he survives, won't it? I just hate the, I just, don't you just hate though the way in which, and this is, and I hate to say it's Trumpian because Trump is his own distinct thing, but there are just mm-hmm. echoes of, the Trumpian approach. I had various conversations this week in in London with people. Some of them t- Tories who should know better. Really, you'd think in terms of decency, who just try and just try and sort of you know just try and sort of just get round the whole thing just by saying well, it doesn't really matter. We knew it, but this and that's what Boris does is that he. There's so much chaos, and you get so you get used to one development, and you to file that away, and you think, well, you know that, and that's old. But actually, let's just stand back from it for a moment. This is in December. There were no parties, and he had been assured that all the rules were broken. There's so much we've learned since then, which casts a lot of doubt on that. 
And you sometimes just have to stand back from the whole thing and think, well, look, the government which imposed the most draconian rules in peacetime, which spent hundreds of millions of pounds of our money on broadcasting um, stuff which was kind of Orwellian in tone with warnings about what it meant to go outside, about being with more than one person and about the consequences and the fines and thousands of people were fined. But while that was going on, the person who runs the government was taking a very casual approach to the rules. I still find that original crossing of the line I'm not I'm no longer outraged by it I mean you can't be outraged forever but I just think that is a terrible transgression I think it's really difficult to see how a prime minister survives that destruction of trust Alistair am I being too harsh uh no yeah I agree because we were told that you know popping around to have a coffee with someone was you know we were told to make an equivalence between things which ultimately were probably quite low risk and and the language of death knell and killing and killing your granny. you know I remember yeah matt hancock saying don't kill your granny what, what a thing to to say to children and teenagers i mean um yeah and it just it, uh, you're right you, sort of you have to have a sort of economy of outrage and you can't be angry forever and there's, there's you know people made mistakes and but the, clearly the culture emanate, which is what was sort of quietly damning aspect of the Sue Gray report, is is it in its own sort of quiet civil service way did sort of say they did it and the culture was fostered by really senior people in the British government. And, and that includes Boris, who leads the British government. So, but yeah, you're, you're right, Maggie. It's a finally... I find it interesting. It's obviously a finely tuned judgment because I think, and again, you, you both of you will be able to cast more light on this, but I imagine Tory MPs are saying, well, you know, come the next election, we're probably not going to, you know, the Tories are probably not going to get another massive majority, but they might get a majority of 20 or 30. Mm. And um, given that, the SNP and um, the Lib Dems split the opposition and just uh, d probably won't even matter. And if Boris can get the Tories to do that, then then maybe yeah. they, sh they should carry on with it. But, um, but That's, just, that I, I, is I'm the sure calculation. Labour seem, yeah. Exactly. Labour other... seems to be getting their act together. You know, I, I just think mm. that there's more to it and there's stuff still to run. The, the, the Met hasn't, you know, that I don't know that, it's going to look terrible when when um, I imagine fines are doled out. You know, it's yeah. it's not going I, to I, look I, good. I, I will be I will be surprised. It's not impossible, and there is, as one of Boris's um, great supporters said to me, they're um, admitted that it's tough, but that there's a narrow path to to survival, and he thought that he would walk that narrow path. I I, I still think. And it's, it's difficult to separate in these cases, isn't it? it, it wish fulfillment or confirmation bias from trying to analyze the situation. It, it's difficult. None of us know it. It depends on public reaction, the polling, the response of Tory MPs. If, 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 stress if, don't know yet, but uh, if, if fines happen. But. Um, or, or another crisis. It will probably be something utterly different. Well, I know so this is it, you know, for, thing, or borrowing more money, or you know, well, there's another Jennifer Curie waiting to come forward. You know, it's only four weeks, enough. it's only four weeks since the political discourse was dominated with the return to Westminster and the first PMQs by oh, look, Boris has got a haircut and was pretty good at PMQs and has put all the unpleasantness behind him. So on everyone goes into you know into the into the spring and look what has happened in the intervening months look look how much damage has been done you look at you talk to pollster, pollsters as well look at just how deep it has sunk into public opinion and people's attitudes in terms of favorability and what's coming out of focus groups now people say well 
people trying to defend Boris said, well, uh, the, the public are bored of it. But as we've discussed before, it, it is perfectly possible for it to be simultaneously true that people are bored of the media banging on about something, but that they also have formed a settled view that behaviour was wrong and that trust has been irretrievably broken. But you put your finger on it, Alistair, in terms of the analysis. The analysis is, look, how bad can it be? He survived previous terrible scrapes. You're just going to end up in a situation a bit like, you know, who, who's really going on now about the early pandemic? The human brain buries trauma, come out the other side, inflation will um, sort of tail off and bounce back from from the pandemic. And then on, on, your, on your role, uh, Labour will take some, seat, some seats off the nationalists in Scotland, potentially. Tories will lose maybe 20 seats in the red wall. Just That's just the way of these things. And when you add it all up, the Tories will have a majority of 25 and Boris will, will, will then sail on till 2028, 2029. 20, it's, not, it's not completely impossible, but it just feels to me as though what's happened, Maggie, in terms of public opinion, it's just it just feels done. I mean, every, I had conversations with people last night of a very politically engaged audience after a, after a dinner. And when someone defended Boris at the dinner, no one even bothered to argue back. It was just an it was just an awkward silence. It wasn't uh, there was no there was no rant. People weren't shouting saying he's got to go. It just feels done, and it's a question of question of how. Mm. I would suggest another um, reason, perhaps, why the MPs haven't gone written their letters. In, an, in sufficient numbers yet, and that is that there isn't an obvious candidate. I know you might say, well, actually they emerge, but I think you, the Tory party has sort of got to work out what it's about before maybe there is a leadership challenge. You know, um, Rishi missed his chance to try and be the low tax, small state, Liz Truss has been sort of yapping on about it. Um, Jeremy Hunt, um, Starry, uh, they, th there needs to be more interesting debate, I think, before you even get the, the seeds of some sort of uh, contest. Yeah. And most of them, I mean, well, they're going along with the high spend, high tax, net zero for the moment, because they think it's more. But I wouldn't think that could change. Wouldn't you expect, as someone said to me last night, the one of the contenders, like, say, Jeremy Hunt, you, wouldn't you expect him about now that he's been very, very quiet and the rumour is a deal has been done with Rishi Sunak and Sajid Javid to, to mm. divide it up between themselves and be a triumvirate and the, the, there is a question about whether these pacts ever hold. You know, Michael Howard's pact with William Haig didn't hold in 1997 and, and Haig changed his mind and ran and, and be, became leader. So... Sometimes these things just don't last. But even accounting for that, wouldn't you expect Jeremy Hunt about now to be making a series of policy speeches about the future of the country, about yeah. healthcare reform, yeah. about foreign policy, a, a, a range of um, range of things? Or maybe he's just worried well, about being interpreted about about that being interpreted as starting a leadership. Um, uh, you know, campaign. However, I just think there is a, a hunger and an appetite for people to hear some new thinking and some ideas to move beyond this this mess. So we'll say we'll we'll return to this next week. Is there anything else we want to to tackle, Maggie? You were going to mention gender neutral. I was toilet, going to... but that takes us onto the whole Adele question. And uh, well, no, it doesn't Brit. actually. I think it's a it's it sort of infrastructure issue. Um, right. It's seen infrastructure and, and good buildings. So it started off this week, Costa, somebody complained that Costa coffee um, shops had um, uh, male, female, and then they both had become gender neutral. I'm not sure if I got it the right way around and that there was nowhere for just women to go. So i.e. the men could go into both, but women. And then I noticed another, somebody else tweeted yesterday, was, I think a theater in London have become the same. Now, um, my um, issue with this is that if men really like going into nice, clean women's toilets, why don't we make the men's toilets much, much nicer? So rather than just nicking all the, you know, cubicle type things, 
because most women do want don't want to have mixed toilets interesting i think it, i think it's a nice idea like world peace but i just i just don't see it ever ever happening we, just because uh, because they're full of men yeah well, but, okay fine but, but what i'm saying is why are men trying to take ladies loose i agree why with can't you. they sort out their own loose i agree with no issue. urinal has ever been invented that actually works well there we know, go as, as describes um try going to the the lunar urinal with the kilt on uh, it never it yeah. makes you never want to <laughs> Guess the loo standing up over again. So. I once got caught on the boat going from uh, Newcastle to Gothenburg. I was quite young, actually, a young teenager. And, I, and the signs were pretty female and male looked identical. I got caught in this massive <laughs> men's loo where there are about 20 urinals. I had to sit and wait and keep looking under the I'm sure everyone had gone. It was a terrible Worst experience. is in stadiums. The life. atmosphere in... Yeah, the atmosphere in the male loos in stadiums is just yeah. something, something hor uniquely horrible about it. And, and listeners will be able to describe better than me what it is that is so horrible about them. But, yeah, we'll move on yeah. from this in a. We'll move on from this in a second. But um, yeah, I just I I I'm continually astonished that. that that women well women are speaking out about this now, but just this this erosion of women's spaces and just the, the, the just the inherent misogyny um i just i just find it staggering that there isn't that there aren't kind of riots or marches to to defend to defend we'll to chain defend. ourselves to the women's lose i just mean that I, it's not just about that but can, can yeah. more more broadly um and then we we were we were going to mention Adele, but there's not much to say really, is there? I mean, she you you said it all in a piece, Maggie, on reaction this week. And as I said, she has the bigger voice. Yeah, though you did mention what's the song she sings about setting fire Set to the fire rain? To rain. It's How do you do that? Song. But what does it mean? I don't know. It's just a brilliant line, though, isn't it? I no, it's not. I just I think I find it permanently baffling. How do you set fire to the rain? If any of you know the answer on how to set fire to the rain, then get in touch with us at Reaction. But this was the Reaction podcast that you were listening to. The Reaction podcast is back. It's really good to do this format again. Really enjoyed it. It's available as a podcast. It's also a few days later then available on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So you can go also to YouTube uh there on the site and subscribe to that you get my author interviews as well with leading authors and if you're not a subscriber to reaction and you've listened to this and you want to become a, a full member of reaction you get my weekly newsletter on politics you get maggie's column you get all sorts of other great things from the reaction team then go to the site and the details also are below and we have our first event coming up with Justin Webb sort of post pandemic. Yeah, we didn't really talk about the end of the pandemic. Oh. I know people are then going to get in touch and say, what are you talking about? The pand pandemic isn't really over. But it does feel we were all in London this week in in the reaction office meeting on Fleet Street and it felt, didn't it, Alistair, mm -hmm. like so two years had passed and well we'd lost two years, but we were returning to something like normal life. Mm. Yes, well, there's a there's a fascinating Twitter thread by someone called Christina Pagel at UCL, um, who's a uh, saw that sort of involved with the Independent Sage group, um, Indie Sage, and uh, talking about th this idea, uh, criticizing the idea that we can return to normal, that nothing will be the same, and and that's fine, and you know, on the surface. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Obviously, you don't go back. Things don't go, revert to precisely the same. Behaviours will change. People will wear masks in public transport, you know, at certain times of the year, all that. But people who are sort of craving a kind of serendipity or kind of less emphasis on this kind of suite of measures, which are always presumed to... Um, to work in sync such as ventilation masks testing etc cetera, etc cetera. all of which are in general don't affect nice middle class people but affect people most of the time who are in service and actually has, have a huge effect on schools like yeah. dropping the isolation legal isolation thing does not actually affect most people because most people have been 
you know, well, you know, the work from home class just works from home for a bit, isolate. But it has been dreadful in schools. Anyone who has children, I, I know it's relatives who teach, it's literally that is the only thing it affects because that's where it yeah. can be enforced. It's, it's just, it's really bad. So dropping that, I think, has been a perfectly sensible move and people are very much attuned to COVID and test themselves and isolate when they're ill. And that's always been true of um, infectious disease that we've lived with for for decades as part of a kind of long moral yeah. cultural evolution of what it means to live with diseases like like respiratory viruses, which can be very nasty to yeah. um, to people you love and and people you don't know. And we've we've always there's always been that thing, and that's not science based. It's a broader kind of morality. Um, there's so, there's so much in that, and I did think when I was reading read that thread that you described there is it was just a kind of reminder of i suppose being a, being philosophically conservative i would i would say this but just the the idea of that you that there's a normal to return to a sort of fixed human state now i mean it's just what's happened to us in the pandemic is just yet again history showing us that well i would argue that progress or the perfectibility, a state of utopia, the perfectible goal, all of that is impossible and a, and, and, a, and a dangerous myth. But the change is constant. You know, so prog progress is maybe an illusion to one extent or another, but that change is something you adapt to. And this is just another historical change, which relative to how badly the pandemic, pandemic might have worked out in deaths, Actually, a combination of vaccines, sophisticated, I mean, I'm talking about in the West primarily, uh, West, sophisticated medical services compared to the 1920s. Death toll, death toll is horrendous, of course, and many people lost, uh, lost loved ones earlier than would otherwise have been the case. But it's, a, it's an experience we've been through. It's a change we'll... We'll adapt afterwards. We'll learn lessons about ventilation, but the the idea that because this one thing happened, we can't have life back. I mean, there's another um, person who shall remain remain nameless, and who did get a bit of a sort of Twitter pile on the the the, the hardliner on on lockdown and and COVID, who then tweeted a picture of themselves on the train, saying first time on a train for two years." I said, like, "Well." Just think how that sounds to the cleaner in Lewisham who has to get the train up to town to clean a government office to carry on getting paid throughout the pandemic. The, the working class people who, and uh, people of all classes who were delivery drivers and kept the country going and did all manner of jobs. Just the the the, the arrogance of that. First time on a train for for two years. Look at me, aren't I? Aren't I brave? Aren't I proud? I missed that, Ian. Who was it? You must name. No, I'm not going to encourage. No, because there was then a lot of. Oh, was uh, that okay? Yeah, I, I thought she. I thought it was a daft thing to tweet, but it, yeah. there was then a pile on from okay. lots of other people from the other side, just being kind of serially unpleasant. But anyway, hopefully we're moving all. Yeah. Uh, we're moving beyond that. But so that was a, a little sort of post match, post podcast discussion on covid and you've been listening to the reaction podcast also available to watch on youtube until next time thank you very much thank you